We are keeping our eyes still on the coronavirus outbreak. Now the virus has spread to 24 other countries with a total of more than 3,000 confirmed cases. The Chinese government and global health authorities have spared no effort in containing the spread of the virus. Earlier on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, I spoke to Marlo Ferrari, who is the president of the European Research Council. He's also a world-renowned nanomedicine pioneer. Here is his take on the health crisis. May I have your latest reaction to the health crisis that is going on with the coronavirus from a researcher and research organization's perspective? It is uh, my heartfelt concerns go out with the greatest affection and compassion to the great people of China as they are facing this true emergency. It is, uh, of course, much is unknown yet uh, as to what uh, the distribution pattern, for instance, and mechanisms for this virus is. But I'm very comforted by the fact that the Chinese government and the Chinese people have reacted in a way that is uh, very, very, very massive, very powerful, and hopefully will be able to contain the disease. Uh, and uh, truly, this is one of those situations where the importance of science becomes so dramatically relevant and where the importance of collaboration becomes so incredibly relevant. Now, China has done incredible things in its growth, in its scientific production. It has been absolutely amazing what the country of China has been able to do, especially in the last 30 years, and I am really, really, really very impressed with the incredible progress. So I have great confidence that Chinese scientists will be able to address the fundamental mechanics that have to do with this disease. But when it comes to containment, when it comes to public health reactions, as well as on the science side, this needs to be done in a collaborative yeah. fashion worldwide. Talking about collaboration, the collaboration between China and Europe, particularly in science and technological research, medical included, yes. is very crucial. Now, tell me more about your understanding about level so far. Uh, to what degree would you like that to continue, sir? Yes, absolutely. It is the nature of science that we collaborate. The science works best when collaboration and flow of information goes unimpeded between laboratories. Scientists are inherently collaborative. You can go to a laboratory in China or in Europe or anywhere else in the world and people interact in the same way. If you close your eyes, you don't even know where you are yeah. because scientists always work in a collaborative so mode. What are some of the areas that you are really looking at right now for collaboration? <clears throat> Abs absolutely. So uh, the way the European Council Research Council works, let me tell you about that a little bit. The European Research Council is the main funding agency for Europe, for European countries, and for associated countries that are for instance, Israel, for instance, Switzerland, they are not part of the European Union. And what we do, we provide financial support to scientists, but we don't tell them what they need to work on. We allow them, we trust the world of science, we trust them to propose to us what I think are the most interesting problems and their breakthrough frontier, high risk, high pay of solutions. I think in a research strategy, there must be incremental research, deployment research, development, and that is very necessary. What the ERC does in parallel with that is focus on the breakthrough discoveries, which are typically pre-competitive, very open to collaboration. Yeah. And in keeping with that, we are open to the world, meaning that we accept proposals that literally come from all over the world. We have about 40 Chinese nationals that have been funded through the European Research Council and we cherish their contribution and we look forward to continuing to interact with China. What are some of the specific areas you are looking at? Can you give us some? My personal opinion, again, ERC does not dictate where people need to do research on, yeah. but my personal opinion, I believe the quantum computing is a foundational platform that will completely revolutionize mm -hmm. humankind. Climate change research is fundamental in everything that starts from data collection, the mathematical modeling that requires computational tools, the ability to predict, of course, is very important. 
The notion of planetary boundaries, climate change is one, yeah. but there are eight other boundaries that need to be that we need to be concerned about things such as uh, nitrogen uh, and uh, and potassium flow yeah. ozone in the stratosphere diversity biological diversity all of these things are connected in some ways that only basic science can understand and each of these can be triggered into a spiral of catastrophic consequences for all of humankind right. so that's a big area for science focus for sure Cancer is a primary mission, of course, of the European Union, and cancer is an area where I think uh, the whole world working together right. in a collaborative fashion can bring us to the point within this generation where the word, the word cancer is no longer a death sentence for anybody. Some have been talking about, you know, the strategic fight against the 5G, which is just one small part of all the technological yeah. development. What do you make of this, you know, geopolitical, economic uh, uh, interest competition and many other things that is concentrated on one topic? Is this yeah. going to be crystallizing some of the future debates we have about science, about cooperation, about application? <laughs> In some ways, I think that is a paradigm and is something that may bring some people to think that we will find the same in all great technological discoveries, scientific discoveries in the future. I do not think that will be the case. I want to clarify the science is one thing. Trade is another thing. The dynamics between countries, of course, are something that is of great importance and with peace in mind, everybody needs to focus on to foster diffusion of these concerns, yeah. science is a force for unity. Science is a great way to address those tensions and to reduce them because science by its own nature is collaborative and scientists always want to work right. across borders, across frontiers and bring down the tensions between countries. Well said, what about the disruptive innovation? What do we need to have in order to have that? Everybody when talking about disruptive innovation have their eyes lighted up. Yeah. But what would make us there? Great. Some of the most important points. The most important point is that we need to allow scientists to be creative scientists to be themselves so that they can truly express themselves without boundaries. That's what we do at European Research Council, ideation, creativity. Yes. And then we need to have around them infrastructure that allows for translation of their ideas into practical realities. Indeed. We should not ask scientists necessarily to do both, nor development experts necessarily to be scientists. We need to build teams where everybody plays what they are best at, what they get so excited about that they glow in the dark. They need to be themselves. So we need to allow people to be themselves, let creative scientists do that, and help create an infrastructure around yes. them, which I think China has been great at doing, so that you can bring these discoveries into practical realities. What a pleasure having this very first opportunity to talk to you about many important subjects related to scientific research. I hope our conversation will continue as time goes by. I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, Thank for you. your precious time. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Mauro Ferrari, the president of the European Research Council. You're still watching World Inside with me, Tianwei. Still with us, and we'll be back after this break. Welcome back. I'm Tianwei. The coronavirus outbreak this time already lasted for about a month, if you look at the timelines in retrospect. And earlier, I've been covering the story by interviewing one after another experts and real people in the know, starting from the World Economic Forum, which is a forum about geopolitics and economic development, but at the time when a health crisis break out, people are paying their attention 100% to that topic. So as a result, the forum originally in geopolitics and economics was then filled with discussions about public health management. Our last segment today, here's our, some of the interviews we've been having over the past one month about this specific topic and some of my thoughts on it as well in retrospect. You just never know what would come next.
When I took the World Economic Forum in Davos as my last assignment before the start of the Chinese New Year, the news broke. A new form of coronavirus could lead to another public health crisis 70 years after SARS. I remember SARS and what it meant for China. As a result, the coverage of geopolitics and world economic output also took a turn there for a brewing public health crisis overnight. The biggest question, what is the situation on the ground? Has China been forthcoming and straightforward, transparent with the rest of the world about it? Chinese authorities have done an excellent job of trying to figure out what's going on very quickly. And not only have they been figuring it out, but they've been spreading the information, allowing everyone across the world to see it. They figured out what the virus was, they sequenced its genome, and they publicized that uh, almost immediately. But still, people are concerned. So I asked this gentleman, who explained clearly and in again, a straightforward you know, manner you know, from what China should do. I can always you know, see the dilemma you know, relevant government agencies are facing. On the one hand, they don't want to create unnecessary panic in the public. You also do not want people to underestimate the potential risks. I think the lessons we learned from, from SARS is that in this, in this kind of situation, don't be afraid of telling the public you don't know everything. Try to provide as much information as you know and, and be ready to say, we were wrong yesterday. And here is the latest information that we can update you. I think only through that kind of honest, transparent communication, then you will substitute the trust of the public relying on your source of information mm -hmm. rather than on the rumors from their friends, relatives, and so on. But things were happening so fast. Various media reports suggested the number of confirmed cases from Wuhan have been rising daily and there were cases already elsewhere in the country. The public health front of the Hubei province was under extreme stress and at the same time, China's research capabilities in response to the outbreak were being tested. So would there be the right medicine for the infected? Would there be vaccines for everyone? There is a frustration among the general public. People look at vaccine as one of the solutions. But why so slow? We're seeing new emerging diseases almost every year. We need to have frameworks and technologies in place like we have for flu, where if we need to develop a new vaccine every single year, we can do it. And we cannot do that right now. If you leave it to the private sector, things are going to be done that make good business sense. The clock was ticking in China against the outbreak and also on the Swiss mountain slope. After many rounds of China, back and forth, Peter Pyatt, other diseases the like legendary like expert who helped problem. to discover the virus that led to Ebola, finally agreed to speak to me. These are viruses that are so-called zoonoses. So what is a zoonosis? These are viruses that infect animals. But when they jump from the animal, let's say it could be a chicken, it could be a bat, to humans, then you get these uh, epidemics. And uh, when you look at, uh, for example, Ebola, uh, the reservoir is a bat. Uh, when you have MERS in the Middle East, it's camels. Mm. Uh, you have with SARS, civet cats. Uh, influenza is usually birds. You cannot control an epidemic or you cannot develop these new vaccines without very strong collaboration. When I rushed back to Beijing, China already advised all travelers to wear face masks to prevent the further spread of the virus and the airport looked very different. And the numbers of confirmed and suspected cases swelled. Health authorities put out daily bulletins, and the media was dealing with something it had not for quite some time. The crisis went on, but concerted effort to combat the crisis also became clearer. Look at this photo. Not look at me, but the almost empty street of Beijing behind me. I was on assignment crossing a yearly very busy street. The public holiday for the Lunar Chinese New Year has been extended to prevent and control the spread of the new coronavirus. 
The WHO also declared the latest outbreak related to novel coronavirus a fake or public health emergency of international concern. At this point, things became very different. As a result, efforts from the first responders are becoming ever more restricted. They are the medical workers on the front line. They are also the construction workers who work the day and night to build the two special purpose hospitals for novel coronavirus patients. They are also the researchers and scientists, such as Zhong Nanshan, the Chinese epidemiologist, who discovered the SARS coronavirus 17 years ago. He also, this time, broke the news about the possible human to human transmission. And his friend, a group of health experts and scientists from all over the world. Professor Yin Libkin is among them and probably one of those who worked most closely with John. He carried the 10,000 okay. test kits so with him 17 here. years ago and brought them to China to help the country fight SARS. He was here again to see and work with his Chinese counterparts. When scientists that would be talk, your baseline, but we you don't better have listen to like that. that. So what we really need to do is to say, we're going to test this drug versus purely supportive care. And then we have to compare the morbidity and mortality associated with those two groups of people. And it has to be designed in such a way that it's going to be uh, statistically powerful enough so that we can get information. But until you have accurate ways to diagnose cases, to make comparisons between groups, you can't really begin to start talking about therapeutics. This is difficult. Now, everybody wants to test their own drug. We just need to do it in a way that is scientifically and ethically sound. At the moment, the crisis is still going on. So are efforts seeking solutions to it. And so is our coverage. This is going to be unforgettable for me. And I guess for every one of us. I'm Tian Wei. Be healthy.